On the podcast today, we are going to talk about the practice and mentality of surrender in spirituality, specifically in Taoism, Hinduism, and Buddhism, because it plays a big part, especially in those Eastern traditions. And a lot of people have a nervous reaction to surrender, because surrender requires humility. It requires having compassion and forgiveness for others. And I think a lot of people misunderstand the surrender, true sense of surrender, as in um, like become a weaker person or like a like a lower level individual or something like that. But it's got nothing to do with uh, that kind of uh, preconceptual ideas. No, it's far more to do with humility about the down regulation of your own sense of self or ego. It's far more to do with that. But that's why it's really frightening for a lot of people as well because especially when, let's say back in the counterculture movement when a lot of Westerners came across Eastern spirituality and they were introduced to such paths as like bhakti yoga or just the bhakti movement in general in Hinduism, there's an emphasis on devotion and surrender to something greater than yourself, be that Vishnu or Shiva as a representation of Brahman. And even when people... Uh, were introduced to Taoism because in Taoism to align with the Tao you have to have a sense of surrender you have to surrender yourself to this greater force that is actually guiding your life and is actually at the the, the core of our being and so in a sense we need to surrender this this habit of trying to control and manipulate life according to our own personal beliefs and agendas and our own in, in essentially our own ego so, yes, yeah, surrender takes a big part in Abrahamic religions too. I think, mm. um, especially like Christianity and um, Islam. But I think, in a sense, that the way nowadays how those um, people who practice a true sense of surrender is maybe um, Muslims may seem much more authentic to me personally. Mm. Reason why is because. Um, Nowadays, in Western Christians, um, they do understand the sense of uh, what uh, is to um, surrender to God and how it is important to their um, spiritual path. Mm. But but still, there is a um, conceptual idea on things, right? Me and you. Um, my family and others and this kind of still um, conceptual and dual sense of surrender mm. the way the mm. way they think of surrender is yes. so that is not the true sense of a surrender surrender means really like uh, you kind of destroying your ego basically you you as a person have to be gone disappeared mm. right mm. Mm. But when you hear that, it's, like you say, it's pretty frightening for a lot of people. So that uh, in nowadays of uh, Christian in Christianity, it doesn't get practiced um, in an authentic way. Whereas, uh, like uh, Christian mysticism, which is Gnostic, like in, in our day and uh, all days of real uh, Gnostic people were. Had, had true understanding of what surrender really means, right? Mm. So that they really uh, practiced that full heartedly. But nowadays it's, it's kind of, um, yeah, mis misunderstood. Whereas um, Islamic religion, the Muslim people, to me, seem much more um, authentic and more full heartedly because they really do surrender. Mm. to God like they pray five times a day for entire their life mm. and whatever happens to them they credit God and whether, whether that's good or bad and there's no such, such sense of them their own persona at all mm. which is very hard place to get to but that's why I have a lot of respect to the authentic um, Muslim people mm. Yeah, it is a fundamental difference, like you said, with Abrahamic religions. There's still a difference, uh, the differentiation between uh, self, person, so persona, and God, right? There's a, there's a disconnect. Mm. Now, as you, as you made a good point, Muslims uh, cater to that much more authentically, and they, 
they really do surrender well some do mm. but in general like if you do go to some parts like you know you and i have spent a lot of time in the middle east and most people in general are very good people and and down to earth and they are very honest about their religion and a lot of people you know get obviously triggered by m muslims these days and islam because of you know certain events that have happened that we're not going to get into but in general they have that uh deeper quality of surrender but the difference is i guess with the with the eastern parts of surrender is even though it would be in line with, say, Islam, it's still about the complete dissolution of the self altogether. Even though you, you can argue that uh, Muslims in the way that they pray and everything like that uh, has a, you know, a humbling effect on their ego, and it would, it definitely does. But the focus, I think, is different too, because the orientation of the Abrahamic religions is that there is a separation between hmm. individual and God. Yeah, it is more like ex external it's an ex idea of an ex God. Yeah. Mm. It's kind of an external idea. It, it can be for some people. Can be. But there's still just a fundamental idea that, you know, you are beneath and you ought to fear God. You know, I, you know, you hear that often with people in the Abrahamic faith. It's like, I only mm. fear God. And if you said that in the East, I only fear God, they'd be like, what do you mean? You, you are God. Yeah, you, right. are, you are one with God. Like, it's, there's no separation. What eclipses that or is a blockage to that is the ego and that's the, that's the understanding of the east the east is that for example if we look at the Tao, right the reason why people don't experience the Tao in their life is because they have bought into this ordinary operator of themselves which is the ego and the ego acts as a blockage to the fundamental forces of the universe. So when you're sitting there as a person, you're trying to control everything in life, that is blocking the actual flow of cosmic energy, so to speak, to flow through you, like which, which will express itself as creativity, as inspiration, you know. Uh, but you can only get to that place when you start to surrender your sense of self, your sense of ego. Now, the understanding, not just in Taoism, is that you are one, actually, with the river, but the problem is, is that you're fighting the river. You're swimming against the river. And so that's why you begin to drown, you, know, you begin to suffer. And that's why you follow the more so the path of suffering <laughs> as, yeah. a, as opposed to surrender. So you have to start to move with the river, and then the river's power becomes your power. You know, I constantly harp on about that in this podcast, but that's an act of surrender. You're surrendering to the current of the river because you can't fight it. The Tao or Brahman is that ultimate reality that is the substratum of all life, which actually uh, is imminent within life, but actually transcends it. And that flows through us, mm. all of us individually. But it's blocked when you've bought into this sense of an ego. Now, ego itself, we could say, is an external construct because it's built on culture, built on tradition, built on things in the external world, education, right? Yeah. And then we buy into that. Now, it's not that the ego completely can disappear. It can in some of the traditions, like in the Avadut traditions and so forth and so on. But what happens is the ego in, its, it in itself becomes a bit cleansed of, of, of its own taints. So what I mean by that is like, you know, it's arrogance and so forth and so on. It becomes more humble and, mm -hmm. and you know, more compassionate and, and, and more giving as opposed to taking from life, right? So, and that's what happens. So... That's why, like in, in Shaivism, they, they, they say the path of surrender is basically the path of fire. Because mm. so what you're doing is there is a sacrifice that happens in Shaivism. Now, a lot of people will think, well, what's that sacrifice? Like the sacrifice of an animal and this and that. It's a sacrifice of your own self into the fire, the ego. So you and I have spent a lot of time in Tiruvannamalai. The whole ritual of Kaptagai Deepam where they, where they light the top of Arunachala on fire, is, is it's symbolic, you know, obviously in relation to Shaivism, the path of Shiva, is it's symbolic in burning away the, yeah. the, the complete dissolution of the ego. So the complete surrendering of the ego or the sacrifice of the ego into the fire of Shiva. And then that burns out all of the, you know, the karma, the vasanas, the samskaras, 
And then uh, Shiva can, in a sense, wear you like you'd wear a Rudraksha mala. <laughs> so Shiva wears you now as a Rudraksha mala. You become a limb of Shiva, so to speak. Yeah, there's a dis- uh, destruction element, but after that, there's a new birth. There's a rebirth, yeah. Yeah, rebirth. There's a complete purification. That's well, right. Purification is a kind of a, a strange word too, right? Because you or, you already were pure. So that more like you've just cleaned the window. The window was all mucky with, you know, your own sense of agendas and beliefs. And you've just wiped it away and you can see the actual light of Shiva come, come through the window now, yeah. through the window of your mind, you know. Yeah, so in Eastern traditions, uh, there is that uh, fundamental understanding that we all are one with God and we are that. With that. So that... Um, work is to rediscover that within each individual, right? Yes. And um, the, yeah, that becomes a, a part of a practice. Mm. Yeah. So when you look at, like, say for example, like sticking with Shaivism, the path of Shiva, like if you look at a prayer in Shaivism, right? Like common prayers, right, around the world in many religions, and also in Hinduism too, people do this. People will pray for a better life for things, for like, just, you know, man, can you help me out? Like, Mm-mm. it's, you're always, you're asking something from Brahman or whatever you want to call it. Something that you couldn't control so that you give it to someone you believe who got better, yeah. like bigger power than you. Yeah. But there's a problem in that prayer. That's not the proper prayer in, in Shaivism because the proper prayer in Shaivism is that you don't want anything. You know, you, you pay respect to Shiva and you say, whatever you desire for me, I accept. Whatever, I, I'm not asking anything. Whatever happens in my life, I know that that's your doing. Mm. And I will, I will accept that and I will move with that. And that's a, a massive act of surrender because you're basically putting your ego on the fire and just singeing it because you're not trying to gain a certain outcome from life. You're just saying that, you know, I will continue to be a human, but whatever you desire for me, I will accept. And I won't, like, you know, a fight, I won't fight it. I won't uh, uh, complain about my situation. I will accept it and, and move with whatever you choose for me. That takes a huge amount of courage, right? Yeah, of course. But once you can do it, the Shiva's power, the God's power become, becomes your power. Mm. You see, that's the point, isn't it? Yes. That's what I mean. Shiva then can wear you like a Rudraksha mala. That's what they sort of say, you know, right. like you become like just a, one of the Rudraksha malas on Shiva yeah. because he can wear you then. He can, he can, you, it's like in Taoism, like, you know, you, the Tao can make use of someone like that now. Before that, you were actually useless when you thought you were useful. When you were mm. this individual, you thought you were useful, but you were in a sense useless. Mm. And in the very, you know, literal sense yeah. but in, in in letting go and getting out of your own way then the Tao can make can make use of you because you're not fighting the current no more and so forth and so on so and in relation to islam is in relation to shaivism islam they they a lot of people do pray like that actually like they you know whatever you wish for me mm. alhamdulillah you know what i mean that's right and so that's a a big act of surrender. Again, the orientation is different. There's still a disconnect. But um, in Shaivism, there's no disconnect. But you are sort of, when you are praying, you kind of, you are speaking from an egoic level because mm. uh, in the end of the day, we all do still have a sense of ego. Mm. It's just, like I said, how strong that ego is as opposed to, you know, has that ego been humbled and has it surrendered to the will of Shiva or the will of the Tao or Brahman? call it what you will you know so yeah i mean in our daily lives i guess everyone goes through it, the moments of uh, frustration and things like that right mm. and then we kind of uh blind to this kind of um insight in that very moment that we uh, well, like whatever that comes at you hard you try to fight harder mm. right mm. But that's not how we should go about. It's actually, again, like you shouldn't fight that current. You have to go with it, and you somewhat have to. Although it doesn't look right, you have to kind of trust and just give it 
to it, mm. let it, so that let it take care of itself, right? Mm. Mm. Without you interfering with it. Yeah. So that's why actually when we try to fight it and when you, you go even harder against it, you really literally go against it. So it makes it worse a lot of situations, right? Yes. And then you after the after the fact that you realize, oh, what if I just left it? Mm. Like none of this, this and this would have happened, mm. right? Mm. Like and mm. I didn't have to be that stressful and this and that, right? Because everything that you are going to do after a certain situation it's just like putting fuel on the fire that's right you know and i know that we get emotional about certain things and and, and then we take a step back after that and we go well, maybe i shouldn't have done that but it's about constantly trying to learn that lesson like you got to put the fuel tank down stop putting the gasoline on the fire and, and just and just let that fire burn out and let those situations fizzle out without playing a part of it right and that's another big part in the Eastern traditions is, is, is allowing life to run its course because you understand mm. that there's something much greater going on here. You don't control the game. You control a small bandwidth of your life. You control going to the toilet, making a cup of tea, things like this. But in the greater totality, you don't control Jack. Mm. And so this is one of the differences between, again, Eastern and Western cognition and psychology because... The West, because of individualism, has always thought that we can control outcomes, we can uh, make our life go a certain way, and that is true to a certain degree, but not completely true. And and as we know in the East, is that there's always been this focus because of the the you know how the environment developed uh, socially, more holistically, and so forth and so on. It wasn't very individualistic, and so the focus was always then on well we just got to let certain things play out certain situations play out you know all of their spiritual traditions are sort of based on that because they learned that in that manner right like they had they learned that well we just have to wait the situation out instead of like trying to control the situation and using shaivism you know like they would probably pray in the morning saying you know you know i don't understand the situation but i trust what whatever, whatever you will in this world for not just for me but for the world and you know that's a pretty hectic prayer to say these days in the current situation we're in because people are fighting everything that's happening uh, but that's actually would be one of the prayers that a shiva would follow is that you know i don't understand because i'm just a human at the, on this level like on this level from an egoic level but i know i trust and i have faith in you that not not even faith faith is a bad word i trust that I know that you know what's going to happen. Uh, you're guiding the world in the in the way it needs to go. Mm. Only we decide if it's whether it's mm. good or bad. Mm. But from the uh, the from the ultimate reality, there's no good or bad. It just it just that's the way the world's going to go. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's a hard. One of the hardest part is that not is not to repeat pattern that you go through every time mm. like mm. you go through the frustrated moment right and you react a certain way and it, there is that certain consequences with that and after you after that happened you realize your your reaction wasn't appropriate was appropriate right then mm. so the task is not to repeat that but when the similar situation happens, it look it may, it may look completely different, but the psychologically, what's going on in your mind is actually a similar pattern. And before you catch your reaction, usually we just react without thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Then you, you repeat the same thing again and again, and then you, that pattern still uh, still there. But the, the job is to just to stop that pattern. Mm -hmm. It's to destroy the pattern and then so you learn the lesson um, first a few times obviously mm -hmm. but the job is to learn not to repeat it and get out of the pattern then once you get out of the pattern it gives you such like a light lightning feel like it's a, a form of like a freedom that you no longer repeating that anymore and you kind of elevate it to the next level so to say and then you 
yeah, like you said, you have that trust to whatever will happen, it'll happen. And whatever that happens will be the right thing hmm. to happen for everybody. Yeah. Right? Well, breaking those mental patterns, emotional patterns, mm. these, this and that is, is, is an important spiritual practice in and mm. of itself, right? Because yeah. like, you're working on karma and your vasanas and ultimately your samskaras because you're trying to break that habit and that cycle of yeah. following the same method of reaction and to situations and we've all fallen prey to that at some time in our life right where where you know certain situations are disguised differently right like there'll be a situation that you got triggered about and then you reacted a certain way mm. and then you go i'm never going to do that again and then another situation which which is actually the essence is the same but it's disguised differently mm. but you only pick it up after the fact. That's right. <laughs> and hindsight hindsight is, is a son of a gun, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I did it again, right? So it's, um, it's about zeroing in on that, you know, and, and, and trying to work on those uh, mental and emotional patterns that we have about ourselves, which, that, that, you know, unfortunately, we continue to uh, manifest negative karma because of that right and and we're we're kind of a victim of our own vasanas mm. our own habits and tendencies and you know like again like perfect example like because you and i've spent so much time in in the in in india for example like and, and in rural india and you know you could count many times the the amount of times that like say for example a western is out of their mind in the street right out of their mind because something's not going right and it's india you know because <laughs> so, things just don't go right you know that's the, that's the nature of the the place like not that it, that's a bad thing but it teaches you patience and resilience and, and this is what's supposed to cultivate in you but how many times you see like because westerners are so accustomed to having things so comfortably they get out of their mind but then you know like a, a, a local indian will go oh, Shiva's coming on funny today, isn't it? <laughs> There's a recognition there that 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 person's not a bad person. They're just that situation has just got them. You know what I mean? And it's a pattern that's manifesting that they've had before. Like, and they've probably had that same situation in India before. Like, maybe they they were riding a bike and the tire went flat, and it's like, of course. You, yeah, every second day. Every second day. <laughs> I mean, how many times have we had a push bike in India? And then five minutes down the road, the chain falls off, and you're like, yeah, oh, well. This pedaling is not right. <laughs> Sits so like rock hard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like it, the, the recognition is there that, especially from those uh, some of those people in rural India, that it's all there. Everything's all part of this this one continuous energy, whatever you want to call it. It's continuous and you know not not just continuous, but like the ever present energy which we you'd call brahman or the, the representation of shiva you know so and that's why the practice of you know working on those mental patterns and emotional patterns is, is essentially why we put the ego on the fire right you begin to surrender to something uh well not something greater than greater than your ego something greater than your ego but actually is you deep yeah. down because we're all Atman deep down. We're all connected with Brahman, the, the undifferentiated consciousness. You're basically surrendering the identity that what you think of who you are. Yes. Right. That's what it is. That's what you need to lower it or just to completely dissolve it. Dissolve it. Yeah. yeah. That's why when we talk about this, especially the art of surrender in, from the Eastern spiritual perspective, I mean, it doesn't really... Uh, relate to all of this modern identity politics that people are people are playing this this game that people are playing in the world right because this knocks down the whole house of cards when you come to this path and we've we've seen it right we've seen because you know you and i we love shaivism for example and we spent a lot of time in shiva places and you see you know what's really great is you see westerners who who do come as idealists and moralists and that from that perspective and thinking that this and that but then the path just knocks the house of cards over yeah it is an example my experience yeah exactly yeah yeah i mean like late teens early 20s we all had um 
these uh, righteous ideas to save the world and help everybody and mm-hmm. like uh, uh, get rid of world poverty, all these mm. ambitious ideas, right? Yes, yes. And I was one of them. But uh, once I got to experience that life of uh, India, and I go, well, what was I dreaming about? Mm-hmm. This is reality. This is reality, yeah. Mm. Isn't it funny that India does that to you, right? It pulls a rug from underneath you. In the, and it's not that you don't want world poverty to end. Obviously, we all do. But when you go to somewhere like India or, or any or other places in South Asia, then the reality hits. And you're, on the, you're, you're, you're in the third world. You know? There's much deeper understanding of life mm. and much deeper insights just kind of grow within you mm. from first-hand witnessing those people's life. Mm. You know, like, um, I mean, like, you, I don't know in percentage how many people in the world living in, I mean, in India, sorry, living in uh, poverty, mm. like living on the street and whatnot, but they couldn't be any happier. Mm. Like, that sense of... Um, grace and the un- understanding that the god is always with them and taking care of them and they are that, that this kind of a common understanding this common knowledge mm. is just uh, within their dna really it is and that takes a big part of their real true happiness i think yeah well india is the perfect example of surrender right so like you have like you said you have lots of people living in poverty and there's a good portion of them that actually do practice the path of surrender. You know, that's the life that they unfortunately fell into. Or, you know, let's, I don't want to say fortunately, but, you know, like like you said, like, you know, there are poor people in the world that actually are much more happy than people who have affluence, right? Like, it's that's a whole other conversation. But, like, that's, that's a fact, right? Like, we've been in villages and this and that where kids are out playing. They're not in front of their iPhones. They're out kicking a ball around, climbing trees and, you know, you know, chasing goats and, you know, all sorts of fun things that, what, what, well, that I would think is fun if I was a kid as opposed to looking, staring at a smartphone and, and looking at nonsense like that. That's another conversation. But the point is, is that there is this great sense of surrender within even, like, even those uh, poorer people have that great sense of surrender. You know, this is a life I was given let's let's deal with it that's a very different situation than a lot of people do in the west right people complain about their situation so forth and so on why you know why don't i have affluence why am i like i wasn't brought up in a rich family or something like this you know what i mean but you know when you look at it who is not many people are right like it's a very small minority of people that are brought up with affluence and in rich families and so forth and so on. Most people in the West are generally middle class yeah. and towards the lower end of middle class. And so, but again, like there's this mentality because of individualism that we shouldn't accept this reality. We should not, don't accept it. You know, raise your fist in, in defiance against the, your, the life you've been given. And that sounds strange, right? Like, because if you mention that to someone in the East, they're like, "What do you mean, Rage? Like, you should uh, you should appreciate the life you've been given and accept the life you've been given. Accept who you are. This is this is again another act of surrender. Like, accept that you've been given this life, and you know, that's it. Move on with it. As in uh, Hindu tradition, they take li- life as an opportunity mm-hmm. to liberate your your being basically right yeah. and all great um spiritual teachers say that uh, be grateful that you were born as a human being at this lifetime mm. so they make good use of it don't waste it right yeah. so i think there is that um real uh, sense of gratitude is there with those people in india for mm. example without intellectually verbalizing it they already know that life is to um, celebrate. Yeah, of course, the and, celebration. Yeah. yeah, celebration and take it as with a big gratitude. Mm. Mm. That's why funerals, right? They're a big celebration. Yeah, it's very yeah. different in the in the West where we where it's all dark and gloomy and it's not that 
people in here aren't sad that their loved ones have died, but it's more of a because of the understanding of you know many lives and so forth and so on. It's more of a celebration, um, especially if someone had attained a Mahasamadhi or something like this, like a great sage or someone like this. You know what I mean? Like so, it's more of a celebration. Yeah, and an acceptance, right? Yeah. So I can <clears throat> I can use myself as an example, right? Both of my parents died of cancer, and at the time, because I was in my early twenties, it's uh, you you don't understand, you know what I mean? Like, because they were fairly young, early sixties, and you just you're trying to work it out and piece your own life together, you know what I mean? So, and I didn't have it like the deeper understanding that I have now, you know what I mean, as a, as a 40 year old. And so there's a, uh, I had to, in, in the end, in the end of the day, I had to accept the situation. Of course I grieved and, and so forth and so on. And I couldn't work it out for a long time, but like, uh, once you accept it and you understand that there's something greater going on here. You know what I mean? Like we, we live our lives with a certain sense of specialness that we, that's not true, right? And this is a Western, a, unfortunately, a bad Western mentality where we think that we are unique and we are special and so forth and so on. And when you cut through all the crap, you're not special, you're not unique, you're very simple, you're ordinary. This is what it really is, mm. right? This is the reality and that people don't want to accept because we're, we're creating a culture like based on the American standard, which is you should be special, you should be unique. Yeah. Go out and conquer the world. Go out and conquer the <laughs> world. But when you start to accept life and, and realize that, okay, my both, both of my parents died uh, and, I, and I was a little bit, you know, on the younger side, early 20s, like... I could raise my arms and say, this is unfair, right? But then people are born without parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, how far down the line you want to go? Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like everyone in some sense has sort of uh, tough situations in life. But it's about an acceptance and an understanding that because from an egoic level, we can't understand the nature of Brahman, right? So we're, we're trying to understand the nature of Brahman and what is going on here in the manifest world. And... You are, you are operating from a place that you think Brahman should favor your life and your circumstances of life when this is all just Prakriti. This is all just nature, the nature of energy and, and uh, mind and energy all just mixed together. And this is just the way life is. It's not like, yeah, th you know, this concept of being blessed and so forth and so on. Like that kind of that idea of being blessed is kind of eradicated in the East. Because the great blessing is the knowledge you have of Brahman or Tao or this and that. That's the great blessing and the great boon. It's not like, oh, man, he won the lottery. Oh, he's blessed. He's blessed. And, it's like, <laughs> and then the flip side of that is, uh, will that winning the lottery ruin his life? And then will you say then, it, was he blessed? Like, was he a married man and he got he won the lotto and then he had more money and he went after other women and his marriage got ruined and then she took all the money from him. And <laughs> so, you know, we can make up any sort of scenario. So was it a blessing, you know? Yeah, I mean, how many uh, stories have we heard that like uh, people who won $100 million and mm. they end up being dead in $100 million. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how the hell that happened, but yeah, exactly. it's just it, too many stories out there like a, that. There's so many, isn't there? Mm. So is it a great blessing then, see? And see, that's why in the East, the great blessing is the knowledge you have of the deeper reality. And that's why always the sages and the spiritual masters were always thought of as the ones who had the great, the, the great blessing, so to speak, even though that their personality wasn't there and so forth and so on. Yeah, the acceptance is so easy to say mm. and it's just it, it, it is so easy to say for other people as well just need to you know accept the mm. situation mm. but actually for anyone to tell themselves that you need to accept certain things to just get over like your experience mm. it, it's such a difficult thing like 
Well, I would never say to anyone if they were grieving from a lost loved one. I mean, it would be rude to say you need to accept it. Yeah, that's you, true. You know what I mean? You, you, that, that kind of virtue signaling is out there in spirituality where people are waxing lyrical and that's a whole other topic. Mm. My situation, for example, it, there's an incubation period of working, of sort of coming to that conclusion, right? There's a, it takes, just takes time for some people. It might take small, shorter time for other people and, and so forth and so on. But you've got to let the natural process run its course. Yeah, whatever the uh, situation you need to accept mm. is closer it is to you, it's harder for you to overcome, of right? Of course, yeah. And it'll uh, come in time with the other life experience and mm. like over time you, you will eventually will be able to accept it. But just to... Um, go through that process is, mm. I think, very difficult for a lot of people. It's an act of surrender, right? Mm. I've seen, for example, I've seen shivers who have lost husbands or wives, and then, yeah. and they've again said the same prayer. I don't understand it, but I know that what you desire for me is what I need. Yeah, you know, and I mean that's just an act of like. I mean, that's just a tenacity that, mm. that a lot of us can't <laughs> you, you get, mm. <laughs> you, that a lot of us can't get to, right? Like, but like having that unwavering trust in in the will of Brahman or Tao, that <laughs> that that's what's important, you know. Like, I mean, <laughs> that um, yeah, it's hard to yeah. <laughs> kind of stuck a bit there but yeah. you know what I mean like but having that unwavering trust that even though I can't understand it egoically from for my own personality I know that that's actually what has to happen yeah and I mean that's such an act I mean like because so many horrendous things happen in the world right and you and you try to make sense of it from your own individual perspective and your own immediate environment and sometimes it doesn't make sense because the injustice can be quite overwhelming but when you see that unwavering trust and and surrender from people like that it's like wow we can learn a lot right like we can learn a lot from those people in time that happened for the better i mean in in the end once you well, God, maybe, maybe, maybe. It, it, it's hard to say, isn't it? Like, I mean, for the better in a sense that your um, spiritual growth mm. as a human being. Like, I remember the story uh, when that individual uh, shut up the mosque in New Zealand. I think mm. you remember the story. It's a pretty sad story. The, they spoke to a husband the, the next day and his wife got murdered you know mm. and he was like just his uh faith in allah was unwavering like he didn't even in some sense seem that obviously he would have been emotional but the way he appeared when he was interviewed didn't appear emotional because he knew there was uh, a greater plan so to speak and he actually forgave the individual mm. who did it i forgive him i love him and you're like, wow, like that can teach you anything, right? Like, yeah, well, that's. And that's the kind mm. of love that we need, right? That's like when, if you remember when John Lennon was shot and they were speaking to him and he said, don't arrest that guy, you know what I mean? Don't do that. But, he, but John Lennon died. And yeah, it's. Hey, you need. Um... In, in from that place you you come to under, understanding that you you as a person really don't, don't exist right that only from that place you can be like that mm. that's why there's a power in it right there's mm. a power like uh i mean we get emotional because there's there's a there's a power in that right there's a there's there's a strength that we, that you can't describe, right? There's a strength in it that you can't describe. It's not from a personal level. It's just a an underlying like uh, recognition that 
we are part of something much greater than ourselves and and though i've experienced this situation i still surrender to to the all regardless of what mm. happens in my life like like with the muslim man in, in new zealand and and so forth and so on you know what i mean so and that's again like you you've put your ego in the fire and you've merged with something greater than yourself or greater than your personality so to speak um and you know we all gonna we are all going to have we're all going to experience injustice in our life and, and 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 times of grief right like that's guaranteed even the richest person in the world will experience i mean this may sound strange but they will experience some sort of injustice and they will have also experienced grief in different ways than what we will but uh, in the end of the day we're all human and this all has to be a surrender to whatever life produces for us mm. you know whatever happens it's like when ramana remember when ramana's mum went down ramana's mum's like ramana maharashi i'm talking about here when he when he left home mm. as a 16 year old boy and his mum was absolutely destroyed she couldn't understand even though they had been around Brahmins, so uh, Hindu priests, um, for a long time. And when she went to Tiruvannamalai, when, when Ramana left Tiruchuli, where he's from, and went to Tiruvannamalai to just uh, surrender to Shiva and to Arunachala, and his mum found him and said, he, he'd been not been talking for a long time, you know, come on, can you talk, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And so he wrote that note. You know, I spoke about this on the podcast before, but we'll mention it again. And they wrote the note said, you know, whatever uh, you think will happen, uh, how, 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 I got to try and remember it. Well, uh, whatever will happen, will, will happen. happen. Try as try you as may. you may. That's right, Jeff. Mm. And whatever will not happen, <laughs> will not, not happen. happen. Try as you may to change that as well. Yeah, everyone's. Uh, Everyone has their own parabdha karma, their own predestined personal karma that we all have to experience in life. And we have to surrender to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what Ramana is kind of tell, telling his mum that, you know, like, there's, you just can't change the way it is. It's just mm -hmm. the way it is. You can fight it as much as you want until you're blue in the face, but it's still not going to change the, out, not going to change the situation. Mm -hmm. And Ramana fully gave his life to Shiva, as everyone probably knows who, who, who is familiar with Ramana. And so there's that act of surrender to something much greater than himself as a person, um, which, you know, as the story goes along, he, he Mahasamadhi merged with Brahman and, and the rest is history, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his point to his mother is that you're trying to change a circumstance that it's, it's been done. Mm. It, it's done. Yeah. Like it's... This is my own parabdha karma, my own predestined personal karma, and that's just the way it's going to be. There's, I mean, try as you may, it ain't gonna. It's no, yeah, it's not gonna change. Not gonna change. It can't change. I see that that idea of parabdha karma is actually very important when we talk about surrender because you're talking about like we've been talking about certain situations where we experience grief and so forth and so on. But if we understand that concept, we're understanding that we're all in some sense, experiencing and, un and unraveling our own karma in a certain way, our own past life karma and mm -hmm. present life karma in this life. And the way, in some sense, it presents itself may seem, you know, disturbing and strange, but it's mm -hmm. all about working on a deeper level. It's all about cleansing out all of that karma and... and, and and vasanas and, and mm. burning that all up, putting that on the fire of Shiva and burning the ego and just. So somewhat like whatever happens to you along in your life mm. is not simply that as a, to take it as an isolated case. It's got a lot more to do with that. Like you said, something to do with your past life karma or life before. Mm. And it presents in front of you in a very weird, strange, very yeah, disturbed way. Mm. 
and whatever happened is happened and it'll be there but job is for us to realize how you're going to deal with it right mm, exactly mm. exactly because think about it like this because like we are all connected and not even connected we're all the same we're all a part of the same thing so for all of us someone had done had done something 1000 years ago that you don't know this person but that determined who you are right now mm. you understand that karma that that person experienced determined who you are right now in this moment. And maybe that grief or something that you're experiencing now will determine another life further down the, the road or determine something else that's going to happen. Everything's all hindsight. As we always say, hindsight's the son of a gun. <laughs> so, but like, that's just the nature of it. That's what the I Ching is, right? The I Ching is this, this whole concept of this interrelatedness between events and, and, and the psychology of the time and so forth and so on that we all experience. And so there has to be this recognition of this, like, no matter what we experience, it, it's essentially something f for us specifically to work through. And it almost kind of... A Mirroring something to you, mm. right, yeah. about yourself, yes. mm. like reflective of, of something that's psych in your psychology, mm. so that for you to figure it out, mm. right? exactly. Yes, to solve that problem, whatever that is, yes, that's dormant within you, that's been presenting it out in a very strange and weird way. But how you deal with it is to how you are going to solve your psychological um, dilemma or whatever mm. you have. Mm. Well, see, the fundamental difference is between, like, say, for example, an atheist and what we are talking about is an atheist would just say, oh, shit happens. It's just life. Shit happens. And that's true. Mm. That's true, you know, mm. too. But that, that shit happens also has a greater significance. Yeah. Not just for your own life, but it may reverberate out into to other lives as well and, and may change the course of life for whatever reason. We can't understand sort of in this manifest world what the process is here. Like we can understand it like if we look at it from a Hindu perspective that there's yugas and so forth and so on and there's cycles, or we could understand it from the sense that there's just this linear world that it's just going to fizzle out one day and well, it fizzles out also with the yugas as well. But only to be reborn, but it's all in a sense this, this maya, it's all in a sense this illusion of person that's trying to hold on to this version of reality that can't be held on to, right? Like I couldn't hold on to the version of reality I had when my parents were alive. That version of reality from what I thought was great but they eventually everyone's parents have to go just a matter of time when. Uh, and the version of reality that I live in now is still great. You know what I mean? Like, would, would I have liked them to meet you? Of course I would have, but that's just not the way it turned out. That's not the, the cards I was dealt. And there's an acceptance of that, you know what I mean? Like, I've accepted that. And so you have to surrender to that to that greater totality, to that that your life is <clears throat> is going to always be fine, you know what I mean? Like, But you've got to get out of this idea of specialness and this and that. Because when you understand it's maya, right? You understand that reality or the, the, the manifest world in some sense is illusory, right? It's, it's illusory in the sense that we measure the world. We measure it according to our subjective view, our ego. Once we cleanse the ego out, then we understand that all is Brahman, all is the ultimate reality and we're only discerning things happening out here as good and bad according to our own our own personality now it's not that you know people aren't going to experience grief and this and that but it, it transforms the way you experience it and your understanding of it mm. you know i think um another thing that um surrendering can be such a threat for a lot of people is because when you 
or to surrender to something, there is an element of uh, uncertainty. Yes. Right? Mm. Whereas a lot of people hate uncertainty. <laughs> they fight that. Yeah, we, we, we want to know, right? We want mm. to know what's going to happen um, 10 minutes from now. I've got to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> exactly, that kind of mentality. And actually, all social... Social structure is built on like that, right? You know what uh, what time the train's gonna come today or next day, or you can search in the internet. It's all mapped out next uh, years of schedule, though, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a strong sense of certainty <laughs> in years of yeah, schedule. Yeah, wow, hey. in our life. I mean, like some busy people have scheduled lined up like five years from now, yeah, if you Christ. can imagine. Like, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen after this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even know what we're going to be talking about five minutes from now. No, of course, not, of course not. But yeah, because there is that sense of uncertainty and we hate it, right? We want to know mm. how it's going to be like and what's mm. going to happen so that we can plan around or we can get an idea of what we're going to be doing and this and that. Mm. But we're, whereas... If we were to surrender to something, there's elements of complete uncertainty. Like you don't know what's going to happen, mm. but mm. you have to completely kind of give it, give it up mm. to, to Brahman. You, you, you need to be completely empty somewhat, right? Mm. But th- at the beginning, there is a fear in it. There's a frightening mm. in it. But once you have a real sense of trust in the process, that becomes a greater freedom, I think. That uncertainty becomes freedom to you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know what? Shiva is going to take care of the Mm. business. I don't have to do anything. Exactly. Almost a a bit like this. Exactly. Mm. Like when Ramana was dying, right? And they're all, where, where are you going? We don't want you to die, Master. And the saints like, where am I going? It's mm. okay. Shanti, Shanti. It's all, it's all good. Yeah. Where can I go? You're talking as if I can go somewhere. Mm. There was never I. I don't exist. I never existed, actually. Yeah. You've bought into this illusion that you existed. And you, don't, you, you just, you never go anywhere. You're part of it. Mm. That's the recognition, right? You're part of it. When you've surrendered that completely, you understand that you are part of, you are Brahman, essentially. Yeah, the recognition is so important, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. And to come to the recognition, it might come easy for some people. Mm. It might not come easy for other people. Mm. But somehow we need to always keep that recognition always in mind, especially when we go through tough times or got into a tough situation mm. like that, right? I think one of the problems is the way that people, because people are materialistically oriented, the way they think about that. So the way they think about when they have that recognition that they're going to just be on the side of the road, shanti like this, and, and they're going to behave like, like a sadhu. And it's like, no, that's not actually how it operates. You still operate and function as you, as an ordinary, normal person, but your life goes on with, with a certain zest and joyousness. But you have this sense of abandon about your life where you've kind of, you've abandoned life itself to just live with life without like opposing it and fighting it. You're just part of the, you've become part of the process. And that's the irony about what happens because once you do have a sense of abandon then you begin to experience this joyousness and zest of life without being associated to certain things, right? This is what Ananda is. It's unassociated bliss. Mm. So and this is why a lot of people who have surrendered have this sense of joyousness about themselves. But their life may not be grand on the surface. You know, they might not drive a Ferrari. They might not have a big house. And like what you mentioned before with in rural India and in poor India, there's people who are just... A, some people are ecstatic with, le- with far less than what most of us here in, in this world have, right? So there's that sense of joyousness and, and zest about their life without like the sense of controlling their life. They're, they're allowing life to move them where they need to be moved and, and guiding their life where they need to be guided, right? So 
Yeah, those uh, people in the rural India are like a living, pure bhakti yogis. Mm -hmm. That they they are they fully accepted the their life itself, and they have pure that uh, surrendering um, mind the mm -hmm. whole time to. Mm -hmm. The greater God, mm. and that's how they can uh, be the way they can be. I think I remember those um, young children in the rural India. I mean, like some of them um, can't even afford to go to school, so they just get into the working and helping their parents and things like that and straight away, but. Their eyes are just like bright as just you know. Mm. Breaks your heart, huh? And, so uh, pure. Yeah, and that innocence and and there is a very strong sense of um, intelligence as mm. well. Yeah. It, in comparison to young children in the affluent country, I see that like even let's say five, six year olds, mm. for example, by that age you already kind of have developed your um, fundamental personalities, mm. characters and whatnot. Subconscious that is already fully developed. And when you see those young children, I feel like a, a little bit, don't feel like they're a child. Mm. They're an adult too. Yeah, too. already, <laughs> but in a not very natural way. Not for some, yeah. They seem to know everything, and mm. they mm. seem to want everything they want. Mm. And that type of um, like matureness in a um, strange way for a child, mm. but for Indian children, completely different. That is real maturity. Like mm. um, they know how to behave. They know um, the ethics. They know. Uh, they have good work ethics and um, they understand the people and they know how to behave and uh, this kind of um, in, in intelligence as a real human being which uh, majority of the time comes from the environment I think hmm. and they are in the environment where living in a such real life hmm. you know hmm. so that's how they can be, I think. Mm. Well, Indian life is really raw and at, on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not up in the clouds and yeah. airy-fairy. It's like, you know, today's is the day, you know? Like mm -hmm. you need to take, you need to seize the day, so to speak. Carpe diem, right? Like it's, uh, for some Indians, if you don't get a meal today, you may not get another meal again. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it, it's really, it's a real life. You know, it's not like uh, the cushy lives that that a lot of us live now in affluent and developed countries. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other conversation. But but again, there is that sense of surrender, and again, that comes back to the environment. That comes back to, like you said, like in the Indian environment is very. Uh, you have to well, the, saying a, uh, the word acceptance is is a silly word because of, there is no like. There's no other alternative. There's no alternative. Like we may say ex we have to accept reality because we may have an alternative. For them, there is no other alternative. That's just the way life is. So if, accept, of course we accept. That's just the way it is. Like it would be a strange conversation for them. But the thing is, life is always like that, hmm. regardless you're, where, you, uh, where you're from, really. Yeah, course, That's yeah. how it is, really. But... Like again in affluent countries, we've are we are so accustomed to getting things in our always in our favor, right? Mm -hmm. We're so get used to it. That's why you can modify it, you can change the situation, you can um, do all these things to you know benefit yourself, and so that we are somewhat very spoiled. Mm -hmm. Whereas actual actually that life is just how these um, uh, Indian people in poverty live. That, that, that's how it really is, really. Yes. Mm. Mm. 
and that's that's the art of surrender right that's the way that's the way it is it's surrendering to life surrendering to the way life is i think don't fight the way life is yeah exactly and i think like i find it really like uh, fascinating is that in hindu wisdom tradition as in surrendering is it part of a big part of the system like mm. in the yoga mm. uh, the bhakti yoga is one of the limbs of yoga mm. And there's a um, Raja, Kama, mm. Jnani, or Gana, all these things. But Bhakti Yoga is in pure devotion. So from surrendering to the God and you showing pure devotion every time, all the time, for entire life, that is a part of the yoga, as a spiritual practice, so that from doing so you will emerge with God. Mm. This idea is uh, within the Hinduism tradition system, mm. so that it's been fully embraced, which I find it very, um, somewhat very sophisticated. Actually, it's not like uh, um, you surrender to God and think of uh, something greater than yourself and this and then. Not not just as in words, as in system. Mm. So that they take it very seriously, and they do understand how important it is to advance in your spiritual practice. Well, it's a dying process, right? The, it's a it, the surrender itself is a dying process. So, and there's a logic. To, there's a logic behind this when we look at it from the path of Shiva. So, because you are sacrificing your ego, and you are surrendering to whatever the greater totality is, whatever you may call it, you are basically saying, you guide my life now. I don't guide my life no more. I'm I'm done with control. I'm done with this and that. You are now you. I mean, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it guides mm. my life now. And it's a dying process. Now, the logic behind it is, so if we look at it from the path of Shiva, right? Shiva being the the, the destructive principle of the universe, part of the Trimurti. Now, that destructive uh, principle, which is symbolized by fire, uh, is the process of death, right? And so the logic behind this is that each and every moment we are living right now, right, you are actually dying, but you don't see you're dying, even biologically. Both you and I, everyone listening and watching, we're all slowly dying. A newborn baby is slowly dying, it's how you see that, right? So what happens then is that if you understand that you're in a process of death, life is a process of death. But what does death do? Death evokes life. You see? So death evokes life. So the process of dying evokes life. Now, when you understand that, not just on a biological level, but if when you transfer that to the conscious level or the, or the level of consciousness, is that life itself is... a Oh well, let me let me uh, rephrase that. As we live this life, the one that we currently have, this process, the ego is in a slow dying process. And the irony here is, as the ego continually dies, as you live, that evokes real life, or, mm. or that evokes Shiva, so to speak. And that's the our life from that perspective is a sacrifice to Shiva. Your life in its totality is a constant sacrifice to Shiva. To recognize and realize you were always Shiva or you were always Brahman or Tao. It's a process of dying. And the ego is constantly dying. It's a dying process. It is a death process. The problem is, is when we're trying to hold on to life, when we're attached to or sorry, when we're attached to that dying process, mm. that's when we begin to suffer, right? So, like if you're like if you're grossly attached to a person that's dying, you naturally mm. suffer and and grieve. That's a whole different mm. thing, right? There, there should be grieving and this and that, but you're attached and you're holding on to your ego, which naturally through life, even though we try to hold on to it as much as we can it gets softer and it begins to 
go through a death process. Now, a lot of people still have such a solidified ego when they actually do go through biological death. That's when they start to go mad and they, they can't let go because they've got five kids and, you know, a wife or a husband and all of these, you know, houses and cars and all these things that they accumulated that defined who they were, but only defined something that in, in the end has to be let go of. So the surrender process is a process of letting go of that earlier than waiting till mm. you die. It's a recognition that this, that life is a process of death. But the, but the irony is, is that process of death evokes life. And that's the concept of Shiva. Because even if you look at Shiva from the totality, the death of the universe evokes the birth of another one. It evokes life. And that goes down all the way down the spectrum to us you know when when we fight the current is is to not letting go their grip mm. right mm. and strengthening the grip yeah the stronger the stronger the grip is more you suffer mm. and what you have that grip on is that the ego they want to die actually yes Right, and it will die. Yeah, <laughs> and you want to um, hold on to that ego that is that have to die, that has to die. Yes, right. But the suffering comes and pain comes. Why? Because it will die eventually, whether you want to let it go or not let it go. Right. Mm, yes. But that very um, desire to hold on to it. It causes all the pain and suffering. Yes. Instead, because no matter that you want it or not, that ego will die eventually. Exactly. So from knowing that, if you were to just not have any grip on it at all, then there is no suffering or pain. Exactly. So you'll be completely be free, really. Free from that. Um, very desire to, that you want to hold on to something. And you'll be free to allow the things that you are holding on to mm. to just live their life because you've let go of your association with them, be that your kids or your husband or your wife, because you've actually let go of your ego. See, what, and that's the point that you're making, that you're essentially what we're doing is we're, it may appear that we're let, we, we can't let go of the relationships we've had mm. but what we really can't let go of is the version of reality we've experienced the egoic reality right that subjective version of reality the mm. like uh, nice memories you have yeah right? we can't let go of that subjective yeah. version mm -hmm. of reality and i know that it may sound grim to people listening or watching but you ha you have to let go of that eventually it doesn't matter if you let go of it consciously now or when you die on the deathbed mm. It's going, regardless. I mean, it, and, 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 and in doing so, as, as I mentioned before, you allow life to live because you've, you've let go of this thing that is constantly dying anyway. And you've allowed not just yourself to live, you've allowed other people to live too, you know what I mean, without uh, being so attached and... and, and in some sense, like you, uh, it's almost like a burden upon everyone else. But when you let go of yourself, it's amazing how much you can love each other more purely and 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 have a deeper understanding and recognition that mm. we're all going to experience this version of where the subjective version of ourselves is finished, kaput, it's done. You may come back in another life and ha still have those same scars wound up, but they're not. Yes. They're not memories in the sense that you know. They're 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 the they're the tendencies and the habits we haven't washed out of our subconscious. It's not that you're going to be in the next life and go, oh, I so remember my husband, you know, from my past life. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. No. You may uh, get a new husband in a past in a in a new life a new based life. on the tendencies and the habits that you have and what you're attracted to. But you're not going to base it exactly on that version of reality that passed before. Mm. 
So it's that subjective version of reality that we, we, we are frightened of letting go of. And that's why there's the path of the Pashaputtas in Shaivism and the path of the Avadutas, the Dattatreya tradition in India, you know, the complete dissolution of self. They came, see, they were like the radical spiritualists, right? They may have been listening to a discourse with you and I back thousands of years ago, and they went, they're right, you know. But so how are we going to tackle this? Just completely, completely dissolve this thing altogether. End this game mm. without even like, even engaging in the game itself. Don't worry about getting a husband or a wife or having kids or getting a mortgage and this and that. Just pull the garage doors down. It's, it's shut. It's over. The shop is closed. You know, so it's the complete dissolution of self. And now the path of, it's believed that the path of the Abadutes, the Abadutas, is that you can resolve all past life karma and vasanas and everything in one life if you're willing to go that you can just unravel it all and just go, no, nah, that's it. Not just, I don't, I'm putting my ego in the fire and slowly dying. I'm putting it in like a, a furnace to incinerate it like in five minutes. Yeah, bring all the past life karmas into this life and just burn it all at this one lifetime and let's just get the job done. <laughs> just get it done. Get it done, yeah. Mm. That's again. That's what's symbolic of ashes, right? The ashes of uh, in in Shaivism or the Avadut tradition. When you, when you see a sadhu or a yogi with ash smeared all over them, they're dead. That life is dead. Now, not that that body and that physical being walking around isn't dead yet, but that sense of pers persona is finished. It's done. They 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 end the game. It's turned to ashes. Now Shiva can wear them, right? Now Shiva can wear them, or the Tao can make use of them, so to speak. I guess the people who have visited India have maybe have seen um, people who naked and with the hair growing so long, mm -hmm. and uh, they all these ashes all over their body, and mm -hmm. people think this is some crazy person, but that's what it. That's really what's behind is. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what's behind it. That's why one of the greatest books for any of you listening or or watching this is the Avaduta Gita. You know, I started my spiritual journey upside down because that's one of the first nidhi, nidhi, yeah, one of the first books I've ever read. Well, not one of the first ones, but one of the most influential ones. Mm. But it's a Nidhyasana text, which is like a text that you're supposed to read when you've gone beyond, beyond the pale, you know. Mm. But I read it first, and so maybe, I don't know, that's why I'm a bit of a nutter. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I highly recommend it to anyone to get into that mindset of, of like what the Avadutes are talking about, like that complete dissolution of the persona, the ego. But again, that requires, even for them, it requires the surrender. But, but theirs is like a, a, a complete surrender, you know, a total surrender because they're surrendering like the idea of even having a, a just an ordinary life. They're surrendering that. Yeah. They're surrendering the, you know, I'm not even going to worry about having a job, not going to worry about having family and this and that and so forth and so on down the line. That's all gone for them. It's it's total surrender. Mm. Now, we that's not going to appeal to everyone. No. Because you can surrender in your own way as well. Though there's may, that, that version, the Avadut version needs to be respected because it's, it's much more of a, like, powerful process as opposed to the way that we may surrender to to shiva or Tao or brahman whatever you will yeah because uh, that path uh, to me is most commit committed to the real real practice yes because we all understand what comes with having things mm. right just owning little things or makes you already think about taking care of it and all these type of things, just possessions itself and relationships. It creates more attachment and mm. it does a, a lot mentally. Mm. We know all that. So to walk to on that path is, um, I think it's actually very important and definitely has to be respected. And um, I think something that 
for anyone to experience for a little while mm. be very helpful from just going to a monastery an intensive um, meditation retreat or any type of um, uh, spiritual um, practice you know that kind of intensive practice for a certain period of time is actually very important just to experience how it's like mm. and how important it is and what ha- actually happens to you from that experience mm. it's like uh, when you know like for example like the, the life that you you and I have had with sadhus right like especially around production I right around Arunachala the the you know how many of our sadhu mates have died over the years but like they're just gone you know what I mean like and all you remember of them and the fond memory we have is you'd see them and it's always like this always a bayamudra but always smiling at you like the recognition a bayamudra a bayamudra for those who don't know means I don't want anything from life I don't need anything it's good I'm completely fine I'm completely fine shanti shanti I'm, I'm one with Shiva and plenty of our friends like who have, you know we have had a good relationship over the years just they're just not there anymore. It's like we talk to our teammates, like, you know, what happened to Guttu Swami or someone like this? And they're like, oh, they are no more. You know how Indians, you know, they, say, they, they don't say they're dead, they just, oh, they are no more. Mm. Oh, jeez. Like, and it's just like they gave their life to that, their whole life. And, and they really are no more. Like, I mean, like, they were no more while that, while, while they, whilst they were living. Isn't it funny, even in India... Understanding that um, Shiva analogy, fire and the mm. dance of Shiva, Shiva Nataraj, and mm. the sculpture and all that. Um, l- in life, physically, literally, is like that too mm-hmm. in India. Mm-hmm. Uh, birth and death is so visible and mm. it happens all the time. It's kind of right in front of you that mm. you can't ignore. Yeah. Well, how many times have we seen guys just. Or, or ladies dead on the street, mm. homeless people, you know, yeah, like yeah. it's just you see it everywhere. Like it's very real, mm. very real, and it keeps you grounded. Which you know, I don't, I'm not saying that all the world should be like that, but India is such a unique place in the world. It's such a, I mean, the spirituality in that country is just overwhelming for a lot of people, you know, and a lot of those things make it the place that it is, really, mm. you know, so. And that's why it's, when people even go to India, you have to surrender to India as, herself. You know what I mean? Like, because you can't fight that. She has her own way, and you have to, you have to get to to move with it and live with it. You know, so. Yeah, that's why the people who can't get their way in India, they end up really hating India. <laughs> and they go mad, right? They go mad. Mm. They they. They just want to fight the situation like any other situation right we fight life because it doesn't equate to our subjective view of the world and surrender is about not fighting life at all because there is your subjective view of the world is only a temporary phenomenon it doesn't even really exist when you think about it because the subjective perspective of the world was built on other things that don't really exist culture socialization things that are temporary education you know that are only useful as a public utility you know and that's one of the things that we need to understand the ego itself is only useful as a public utility it's not that the ego doesn't exist but it's it's a it's a good interface between you know for communication and so forth and so on but it's a terrible planner it's a terrible uh place to be in in your mind if you're trying to understand life and understand the deeper parts of life itself so that's why surrender is so important, isn't it? Yeah, well said. <laughs> and that's about it, isn't it? Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. I really liked when you said that um, earlier, life is this dying process and to recognize it and not to hold on to it. And it's kind of, a again, just to keep practicing the letting go process. Mm. Yeah, again, acceptance and... Just got to keep reminding ourselves to let go of things. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's kind of one of the toughest things to do, I think. Letting go is a perfect 
the perfect words to use, right? Mm-hmm. Like, because that's what it is. It's a constant practice of letting go, of letting go of yourself, mm-hmm. you know, letting go of your ego. And yeah, really, really let it, let that go, really. Uh, you know, really let like, it go, yeah. <laughs> and that's why, that's like, as I said, like you can live with it. Then after that, you let go, you live with a certain joyousness and zest mm-hmm. because you've, you've yeah. abandoned it. You've abandoned that. That's right. It's like being on a roller coaster. You know when you're on a roller coaster and you're holding on to the thing because you, yeah, you, you are crapping your pants because it's going up and down yeah, everywhere. Yeah. But then when you just let go it's and fine. you put your arms in, yeah, it's <laughs> fine. You, you're not going to fall out. Well, unless you're in a really bad roller coaster, you might fall out. But in general, you're going to just enjoy yourself. you fine, yes. And that's what life is like. It's, it's that letting go process of letting go of your sense of self, surrendering that, trusting that, the Tao or Brahman will guide you or allow you to live the life that you need to live in this life without your view of how it should be or your conscious participation, so to speak. So, mm. yeah. And that's what it is. It's that constant dying process. Mm. It's the death of the ego and the death of, the death of suffering. Yeah. Death of suffering. Mm. Suffering is the byproduct of the ego, right? So yeah. Once you have the death of the ego, there's only Ananda. Mm-hmm. It's unassociated bliss. Mm. Your associated happiness is what produced suffering. Yeah, conditional happiness. Yes. Yeah. Is what produced suffering. Mm. But when you cleanse that ego, then there's only pure. Happiness, pure, pure happen, bliss, pure bliss, Ananda. So that's it. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you're doing well. Make sure you like, subscribe. Remember, drop a comment below. All of those sorts of things, for whatever reason, help the algorithm. So if you want my channel to reach the people it needs to reach, then you will help us out <laughs> in that regard. And we. Hope you're all doing well, like I said, and we'll see you guys next week. 